Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today for this uh, July, I call it an episode, but I'm going to call it an edition, the July edition of, um, uh, of, of what is it called? Learn, 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 learn with Google. Uh, yeah. Why don't you just stop and start again, Chris? Just, uh, yeah, let's, 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 let's go there. It's Learn with Google. This month, we're talking about telling stories about place and space. Uh, and I've just learned a valuable lesson. Do not schedule a meeting immediately before this because it really stresses me out. Um, so I'm here today with my colleague, Steve, uh, and we're going to talk today about um, learning with place and space. Uh, before we do that, I just want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet today uh, and wherever it happens to be for you if you're in Australia. Um, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land we live on. And we honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land. And those lovely images there from the Nangala Creative, um, showing some of the um, different countries around the Australian continent. And of course, over here to the other side of the Tasman, Steve. Uh, Tina Anokwe, uh, welcome back everyone, and uh, Manawati Amatariki to everyone uh, in New Zealand. It's the Māori New Year, Amatariki, uh, the rising of the stars. So, ena maunga whakahi, ena waituku kiri, uh, ki te tūpuna tenākwe tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome in and thanks for um, joining us, either live or via the recording. Thanks, Steve. And uh, I just want to point out that our team is growing. I think I might have mentioned this before, but um, we've had a couple of new people join the team. We've got Harris there, who's looking after Chromebook sales, and Darren Macalino, who some of you might know uh, as uh, one of our trainers. Um, and Darren was, was previously with the South Australian Department of Education, and he's now our customer success manager here at Google. Uh, so our team is gradually growing. Um, there you go. Uh, some of the things we're talking about today, uh, we're going to look at Street View and Google Maps. I just want to talk about that briefly. Uh, Steve is going to take us through some Google Earth stuff that is going to be pretty cool because I know Steve is a mad, passionate Google Earther uh, and he's going to show us how he uses that in his classroom. Steve, I threw in a little example about how I used it in my classroom, and, nice. uh, but we'll talk generally about that. Yep. We've got a couple of community updates for you and then our usual What's New with Google where we do a roundup of uh, some of the new cool stuff that's appeared in the last 30 days since we last did the last one of these. Um, I don't put everything into that because obviously there's a lot of stuff that's new. So I try and pick out the six or seven things that are probably the most relevant to us as educators. And if we get time at the end, we'll have some questions. Um, so welcome to Google Geo. Uh, Geo is a, is a collection of tools here at Google um, that encompass a bunch of products. But the ones you probably hear about most are Google Maps, um, which brings in Google Street View, which Steve, I'm just going to talk about briefly before you jump into Earth. Yeah, uh, sure. You've also got Google My Maps, which is kind of an older technology now, but still really cool and useful. And then, of course, Google Earth and Google Earth Engine, which lets us do some great stuff. I'm sure Steve will talk about that in some detail. Um, I just want to touch on this thing. This is when I went to Mountain View a couple of years ago. I saw this city in a case there. This was the second prototype of the Street View camera array. So those circular things around the outside are actually cameras. Um, and this was one of the very first Street View capture devices. Um, since then, it's evolved a little bit, and you might have seen these things before. That's, again, it's a camera array, and those uh, devices at the bottom are things like radar and LIDAR and all sorts of, sort of distance and space and time measuring things. Um, but that's the type of device that captures the Street View imagery that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, that then graduated to being mounted on the roof of cars. Uh, they looked like this for a little while. And if you took that soccer ball thing off the top, um, then that's really what was inside those. Uh, it's just an array of cameras that point in 360 degrees. And obviously, every time they go off, they take all those images, stick them together as one panoramic street view image. Um, we've actually updated this technology a little bit more since then. And now this is what the street view cars look like. Uh, and you can see that camera array at the top there is a much smaller and more precise array now. In fact, here's a close-up of it. Um, it's only it's, it's fewer cameras that have a wider field, um, and those other devices there, again, for location, GPS, and so on. What we do with Street View, I think, is really clever. Um, as I was researching for this, I, I was looking around and seeing how much of the world we've actually covered with Street View is quite astounding. And I often joked about, you know, Google's an interesting company where you can 
probably be in a meeting one day and someone jokingly says, hell, I've got an idea. Why don't we attach a camera to the roof of a car and drive it around every street in the world? And everybody goes, that's a great idea. Um, you know, it's a pretty big thinking idea. Um, but this is uh, what you get if you go to Google Maps. Every time you, you um, engage the street view dude by clicking on this little man down the bottom corner here, um, or person in the bottom corner, uh, these blue lines and blue dots appear and that'll show you wherever these Street View images appear. Um, if you click on the uh, little uh, satellite view thing down the bottom, of course, it overlays it with a satellite image like that. So you can either see the map with a satellite image or just the regular Google map. But either way, the um, Street View dots and lines will appear on the map. Um, and of course, when you go to Street View and you look around, you can look at different things, like this is the outside of the Google building here in Piedmont. Um, now, interestingly, the way we capture it, there's a lot of places in the world we can't drive a car. So, for example, this is called the Trekker, and uh, you can take this into, or we've taken this. You can too. You can actually hire, not hire, but you can borrow the Trekker uh, if you've got a good idea for how you might use it, um, and take it into places where you can't drive a car, like the Grand Canyon. And you can see we end up with trails all over places like the Grand Canyon. Uh, then we've got things like this, where you can take it into the ski fields. And so you attach it to either a walker or maybe to a skidoo or ski mobile um, and then take it around and then you end up with being able to create maps of um, ski resorts all around the world. So that's kind of cool. And we've attached this to lots of other things. This is called a trike. Um, and as some of you on this call were actually here at Google the other day and you might have seen this upstairs on the on level five. Um, so that's uh, that's an example of the the camera's being taken into places. This is along the banks of the river in Singapore, I believe, just there along the Singapore River. So you can see we've got the tracks there. Um, but we've put them on submarines. We've put them in boats. We've put them on camels. <laughs> we've put them on uh, inside these things and take them into galleries. And so you can see if you take it inside a gallery, uh, this is the gallery of New South Wales here, I go to New South Wales, and you can see we've, we've mapped out all inside that building. So there's a pretty good chunk of the world that is um, covered with street view imagery. So I just want to mention street view because I think it's one of those things that, you know, we talk about being able to take your kids anywhere in the world to explore and see what something's like. Um, and it's pretty true. We've taken cars all over the world, on bikes and trikes and camels, um, but people can also contribute their own images. So even in countries where we've never been, like, I don't know, North Korea or, the middle of the Sahara Desert or whatever, guarantee you if you go to the map and turn on Street View, you'll still find blue dots there where other people have added content as well. So there's almost nowhere in the world where you probably can't let your kids look at. I think that's a fascinating idea. So before I hand over to Steve, I just want to mention this little Easter egg that's hiding inside Google Earth, uh, sorry, Google Maps. So if you go to Google Maps and you switch to satellite view, and then you zoom out as far as you can, you actually get a list of planetary bodies appear on the left-hand side. And so you can go to Mars and Earth and Ganymede and all sorts of places. Uh, in fact, uh, maybe if I just switch to this tab and I go to maps.google.com, I'll just show you exactly what I mean. So I'm here in just a regular old map. And once it loads here, like so, I just click on the satellite image down the bottom corner. It switches to satellite mode. And then all I do is I zoom out. So I'm just using my, my trackpad or my mouse to zoom out as far as I can. And you'll notice as soon as I zoom out, that list appears on the left-hand side there. And so now if I want to go and visit the moon or Mars or Ceres or whatever, I can come and do that. And the International Space Station as well. There's, yeah, there's definitely. imagery from inside there. Yep. So, so lots to explore there. I know a lot of schools do units of work on space and space exploration and stuff. So, you know, being able to explore this sort of stuff, uh, I think is really interesting. And it's built right there into Google Maps. Mm. All right, Steve, I am going to stop sharing that because you probably want to share your screen, yeah? Yeah, why not? Why not? And the the Street View Trekker has been up the Waikato River in New Zealand as well on the back of a jet boat. Um, we thought, why not throw in the back of a jet boat and race it up the river as well? So, nice. good times, good times. We did have a guy in New Zealand whose twenty percent project was trekking, trying to do all the great walks of New Zealand with the trekker on his back, which weighs about fifty kgs from memory. Hmm. Um, crazy times. All right, so um, let's wait till this pops up. 
So yeah, um, I I got started playing with Google Earth back in the old days when it was a downloadable thing and you had to put it on a desktop and your network person hated it because it had about a cache of about 100 meg in it, back when 100 meg was a lot of space. <laughs> and, and then Chris and I got to go um, to Mountain View with our good mate John Bailey and, and see this wonderful new earth um, before it was released. And um, it, there was lots of ooing and ahhing in the room when they talked about it. And it's, it'll work on anything with a web browser. And it, it, it'll, you know, anyone can get it. There's no download and there's no extra network space. So we've been playing this for quite some time. And um, we had a few little questions for the, the people when they were showing us their beautiful new creation. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of run through a few of them. So the thing I loved about it is, as Chris said, you can take people anywhere and you can go to lots of different places and it can be used for lots of different ways as well. Um, I know our colleague Chris Hart would, would often use Google Earth as a writing prompt for a Spanish class. So drop them in somewhere and get them to write in Spanish about the thing they can see on the screen. So lots and lots of little cool things you, you can use it for. So here I am on my homepage. Um, now, of course, everyone goes to one place whenever they go to Google Earth, and that's the house. Um, and why you want to go to your house, I'm not sure, but everyone does. And so, you know, down the bottom right-hand corner, we have a whole lot of controls. We have take me to where I am. We have peg person there. We've got 3D and 2D. We've also got our little compass, and we can swap the compass out for um, the the world as well. So you can have a little play around down there if you want to figure out where you are. Um, now, being an ex-geography teacher, I love the fact that you can see the plate margins under the ocean. Um, so some really great um, conversations you can have with kids there. Uh, if you are a bit of a volcano nerd like me, having a look at the hotspot of the Hawaiian volcanoes under the sea is pretty impressive as well. So lots of really cool stuff you can see in here. Now, we can, as Chris said, you know, zoom way out, look at, out in, the, in the stars as well. But a lot of cool stuff we can do. So when we have a how look- did you, How did you get here, Steve? How did I get here? I went, thank you for asking that, Chris. I uh, went to earth.google.com. And um, luckily I, on my Chromebook, it pops up, I can open an app and it'll open the, the Android app as well. So there is an Android app for it that you can use in your Chromebook. And there is also just the web version. Now, it is an additional service for schools. So you, so sometimes people go to it and go, oh, I can't get to it. You will need to switch it on. It is an additional service. Um, you can log in, you can log out. There's all sorts of things, all sorts of different ways you can use it as well. So here's our screen. Um, I, I have a lot of things turned on so you can see lots and lots of little um, labels where we are. Now, if I click that one, allow my location, is it actually going to show me where I am? Yep. It is. We're not, we're not hiding my location. Good. Okay. So, so here I am. Uh, there we go. So, um, the really nice thing here is we have a whole of 3D imagery as well um, that we can get um, by using a couple of different, um, well, it's a zoom and zoom out one, um, a couple of different ways we can kind of navigate our, um, our map is by arrow keys, by our mouse, all that sort of stuff as well. So um, that shows us where we are. Now down the left hand side, uh, we have our little menu that pops out. Now, if we want to get crazy, we can switch on photos and all the photos that have been uploaded to Google Maps will start appearing. Now, if you're the sort of person that doesn't like clutter and likes things nice and clean, I'm looking at you, Donna Galati, pretty much here. Um, if you want things nice and clean, you might want to switch that off because depending on where you are, it can get a little bit crazy with the amount of photos. So lots of kind of uh, integrations between maps as well. So I'll turn it off. Um, also, a map style, we can choose exploration, clean, everything, which is just madness. Um, we can turn on and off our 3D buildings. We can turn on grid lines as well. So if you're teaching about latitude and longitude, you can switch on the grid lines, and you can see those on your map as well. Um, so I'll zoom out, so we can see all the latitude and longitude stuff in there as well, which gets bigger and smaller as we go. So I'll turn those off. Um, I'm going to go clean. There we go. And then I'm going to zoom back in here. So in our little sidebar, that's element. Now we, have, of course, have our have our search. 
So we can do a whole lot of different searches in here. So if I go um, Hawaii, why not? Then a couple of things pop up. So I've got the places. I've got what's called data layers. So there are a whole lot of layers of data that have been bought in. And there is an amazing one called, uh, called 10,000 Years of Volcanoes, which overlays volcanoes across the world as well. Then we have some different guided tours that are in there as well. And if you haven't seen Hokulea's voyage, amazing, amazing. So a traditional um, Hawaiian, traditional po Polynesian walker sailed through the Pacific, um, came down to New Zealand as well. Um, amazing, amazing little story there. Um, so that's our search. Um, if we want to do this, if we go, uh, we do Carmen, there is also some quizzes down the bottom. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego quizzes? And if you are a person who used to play video games when you were younger, like me, the really cool thing about this is when it loads, um, it's the old Carmen San Diego game. And it's also designed it with old 8-bit graphics. So it looks really cool to play. And it's a learning thing because you've got to figure out where Carmen is, chase around the world, all that sort of stuff. So really, really great game, all based around the Earth. So great for spatial stuff. Next one down is the Voyager wheel. So the Voyager gives us a whole lot of really nice curated content. Um, now, this content at the top here changes depending on what time of the year it is. So all sorts of really cool stuff through here. Um, oh, it's, a, it's a sloth there. Um, so we can look at all those little things there. Like sloths, oh, they're freaky things, I can't stand <laughs> them. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, we have some games across there, Jillian's, <laughs> Jillian's giving me the, the stink eye for saying that, I can tell. <laughs> um, there's, oh, here's all our games through here. And of course, we can jump over to education, and there is a whole lot of really cool content tagged for education. Really great one here. Um, oh, and this is school. This is school is a good one. It's amazing. And that one that Donna was talking about is the one underneath, the reading the ABCs from space. Yeah, there's the ABCs. Yep, there we go. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of really great stuff. There's one, there's this is school, and there's this is home, which looks at what home looks like in different places as well. Um, there's also a really great one. Um, where's it gone? Uh, there's a really great one looking at the um, the Underground Railroad, so the the movement of the freed slaves through the United States up into Canada be to become free. So really great stories, and all based around Earth. So around you spatially, you can see where stuff is. So now, now jump into one because let's let's just get the feel of what these look like. Because I think what we want to show people is how you can make your own, right? Yeah, yeah, well, that's it, exactly. Um, let's go back up here. Let's do, this is school. So when you click into a story, um, we have our kind of our splash screen there. Start exploring. On the right-hand side, it brings up some information, gives you some nice little pictures. Now, on the left-hand side, you can see we're actually flying into the location, and we're right inside the classroom. So we, that is a 360 street view you can see there. So we can have a look at that. You know, what do you think that's, that it's, it sounds like in that class? What is it? How hot is it? What can you hear? All that sort of cool stuff, you know? Um, because it's Street View, we can walk around as well. Someone's left their shoes by the door. So we can jump into the next little spot. And what it does here is it'll fly us out and then fly us into the next location. So we are actually going from place to place. So giving that really nice spatial understanding. Steve, can I jump in for a sec? I, I think the thing I really want everyone to understand here that's important is that the layout of this is you've got that panel on the right hand side where you have a picture and then some information. On the left hand side of the screen, you've got a live view of the earth, which can either be the earth view or a street view image. Um, and, and it's manipulable. So you can move in there and actually do it. And then down in the corner, you've got the arrows where you can move from like page to page. Yeah. So what, what we're going to show you in a second is how you can make your own versions of these, but that's the that's the concept for it. You've got a panel on the side, picture and text. You've got a panel on the left, which is live view, and you've got the ability to flip between pages, okay? Yeah, yeah. And I remember when we were, when we were in that room, they showed us this, about 20 hands up, went up, and they went, that's awesome, but can we make those? And they went, oh, no, no, these are from, like, our trusted partners. We said, well, educators will ask us, can we make these ourselves? So 
down this little next this this little bit here this little pin is the ability to create one of these projects i'll get to that just after i click this one the i'm feeling lucky dice the i'm feeling lucky dice will fly you somewhere random in the world i knew a kindergarten teacher that started every day with the kids sitting on the mat in front of the, the, the front of the classroom and she'd press the I'm feeling lucky button and every day for a year the kids would fly somewhere random talk about it for a few minutes then move on with their day That's so by the end of their first year of school they visited like 200 different places <laughs> yeah really so I'm feeling lucky is absolutely amazing and I'll make um our old mate Stuart used to um he had a, a, a uh, an activity called the earth race click the dice four times map where you are and figure out how you're going to get from place to place and it was a race around the world they're really really cool so that's the i'm feeling lucky dice there's also a ruler which you can click on and you can do some measurement so straight line distance if you're feeling really picky you can do all the way around there and perimeter and area so some really cool math stuff you can do through here as well um our buddy uh, Donny Donny Pearcey uses a a um, jumps into earth, jumps into a baseball diamond, figures out the distance from home plate to the back end of the of the um, of the diamond, knows how high the back wall is, and then says to the kids, right, what angle does the batter have to hit the ball at to clear that back wall? So it's a really nice trick example using it inside a baseball stadium. All right, so let's go to the main event. So projects. When we click that projects button, it allows us to create some of those projects um, that we just had a look at in um, in the Explorer up here. So um, in Voyager, we could see those. This is a way we can create our own. So I created a one uh, for Bastion Point or Takaparafa, which is just up the road from our office here. Um, and it was a, a part of our social studies curriculum we were studying. So I had, uh, if I go present, I've got my splash screen, my start screen, if you like. You can see I've got my table of contents here. Um, oh, there we go. So there we are, Bastion Point, splash screen. I can click through the different locations. On the side, it's got some info. So I created this as a resource for my year nine students. So if I jump back, we can show how we do that. So if I go back again, I'm going to go projects. I can go to the top here and go new project and it gives me some options i can create a project in drive because the new google earth creates it as a drive file and it sits inside your drive and it's shareable like a drive file i can open a project so if my teacher had created the bare bones they can share it out with the kids they can make their own copy of it and open that project from google drive a kml is the keyhole markup language was the language that earth is written in so you can import them if you find them or you can import them off your computer so there's a couple of different things but i'm going to create a new project so i've got my my new project you can see here it's saving it in my drive it's auto saving thank you very much if i go up to the head i can click on that and i can share the project with somebody else so yes i've got that how am I going to share it? So I can go in there, I can share it with a bunch of different people as well. Um, so I'm going to go new feature. And I can choose what sort of feature I want to add. So I can do my full screen slide. Oh, what are we going to do a project on? Uh, let's do Fiji. Here we go. Um, it's lovely. Jeez, it, it's almost as though someone just had a holiday in Fiji. So. I know. I wasn't going to say it. Um, so I'm, Fiji is the place, I'm in a new feature. I'm gonna do my full screen slide, bullet, go, that's lovely. I'm gonna click here. Try to do too many things too quickly. Hey, can't spell today, crikey. Then I'm gonna choose my picture. I'm gonna do a quick image search. Uh, let's do uh, do that. There we go. That's going to be my picture. Select that. Really nicely, you'll see down the bottom. It actually gives you a web link for where the where the picture came from as well. So if you want the students to reference everything they've done, there it goes. Um, it's loading in there. 
So that's going to be my start screen. So here's my preview, have a little look. So there's my start screen. It's lovely. There we go. Fantastic. And then we just simply go back and we're going to do the same thing again. New feature. So Steve, yeah. you're almost using this like if, if you asked a student to do a presentation on something and they would normally like use Google Slides or something like that, yep. that if the presentation they're doing something about is a story that could be told using Earth yep. or some sort of geo reference, yep. then they could use this tool instead of slides, right? Exactly. And, and the nice thing about it is if it's in a story across the world and you do get that really nice spatial view of where things are, and it's something different, right? So it's, it's they're doing the same stuff, but they're showing it a different way. So it's something a little bit different. So I'm going to do my new feature. Um, I'm going to search to add a place. I'm going to go Plantation Island. Now, while Steve's doing that, I'll just mention too that the nice thing about this, you might have, if you're observant, noticed that up in the top uh, of the that creation panel where he was playing before is the share button the little head with the plus sign next to it so you can share these google earth projects exactly the same way you share a google doc and then you get multiple people all working on it together so great for group projects exactly so i've flown into plantation island resort there and i'm just going to go over the right i'm going to go add that to my project so here it is so it's dropped me a pin it's picked that location on the left hand side there is some information provided there from the old interweb i'm going to go replace so i can now create a text box box in here in here is my text about bg and plantation there i can click here and i can add some more photos Plantation Island. I like that you can add your photos as well. So you could actually tap into your own Google Photos collection. So so if you were a student and you're going to take in your own photos about something, you could now start to overlay your pictures on these things as well. I'm going to do that. I'm going to pick that one and that one. Uh, that one there. Add that one. I can add some more photos under here if I want. That one. Okay, so and I can even go YouTube as well. So if I want to put a video in there, I can add a video. So you can make this a really nice multimedia resource as well. Let's do that one. I'm going to be a great educator and not watch a video clip before I put it up here. I can choose whether I have a small info box or a large one. I'll go large. And if I wanted to put more and more text in there, I can. Now, also in that box, we can do links. We can change the way the text looks, but we can also switch to HTML. So if you have kids who want to grab some embed codes and embed some HTML on there, it'll actually begin to work really, really differently. A great example of this I saw is embedding, uh, embedding a podcast in there. So get a kid to record a little audio file, put it in a podcast, then embed it in there. You fly in the place, play the podcast, off you go. So lots of little things you can do by switching to HTML mode in there if you really want to. Um, I'm going to stick back in here. I can choose all the different uh, pins I've got. I can change my headings and all that sort of cool stuff through there. But for the sake of today, I'm just going to go, yep, that looks good. Preview that. Um, and this is what it looks like. So here is my location on the right. Let's slide that back in. Here's my location here. Here is my place here. So that's what it's going to look like. If I want a more text in there, that's where I'm looking. If I want my photos, I can go through them. Here we go. And then I can get to my YouTube clip and play that in there as well. So we can add a whole lot of things to um, our project. Now, if I think to myself, actually, that's a bit of a rubbish view, I can zoom out. I'm going to zoom out a bit more like this. And I can actually change. Is that Chris? No, it wasn't me. So let's zoom out a bit. Here it is. I might want to actually 
Oh, he's going to go to edit mode on that, too. Oh, yeah, sorry. Edit that one. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm going to do that, and I might want to ca capture a different view of it. Now, I'm going to just close my little box here as well. I'm over here. I'm in this. There's my little edit pencil there. If I actually there will be good, you notice that down the bottom it says capture this view. So I can click on that, and it's going to now change the view for that pin. Now, if I'm also... I particularly like here, and, and it's an, a bit of an undocumented thing, it's not obvious, but if you hold down the shift key while you drag that map around, you can actually tilt and rotate that. And so you can change to a different view. And so if you want a sort of a sort of a looking down at the earth at an angle, switch that and then hit the capture this view button. And so before you hit that capture this view, just scroll down in the left hand panel, because I think it's worth pointing out that if you get to the bottom, see that latitude and longitude, range, latitude, altitude, all that stuff there. When Steve hits that capture button, capture this view, all of those numbers update. Because, yeah, that looks pretty good. So if you capture that, boom, and see all those numbers updated on the left hand side there, because it's actually capturing that. The other interesting thing, sorry if I'm jumping in here, mate. Oh, go ahead, but, man. But, uh you're not you're just sharing your tab so we're not actually seeing your url bar at the top of the chrome browser oh, right. yeah. but yeah. if we were you'd notice that the url for what you're looking at right now in the browser it can it says it starts with earth.google.com slash blah 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 and there's a whole bunch of random characters but if you start to break it down it actually contains the latitude the longitude the altitude the height the angle the direction in the url mm. The reason that's like mind-blowingly important is because once you understand that every location and every view of every location on Earth has a URL, you could point anyone to anything on the Earth. So if you want your kids to, say, compare two different biomes and write a comparison between, I don't know, the Amazonian jungle and the Sahara Desert or something, right, you could, you could go and capture those two views drop those two urls as links into google classroom and when a kid goes to their google classroom project and clicks on the link that you've attached there it will actually fly them into google earth into the sahara desert and into that specific angle and view that you've asked them to look at mm. yeah the fact that everything on earth has a url is to me mind-blowing it is yeah it is crazy and so and also the nice thing about when you create these projects is that they can be shareable or they can be private you can share them just within your school or you can make them open to the world. So the kids can actually grab them, sh share the URL of their little story um, with their parents, for instance, or with someone else. So if I go preview now, uh, there is my little island there. It's got my little pin. Uh, I'm going to jump back to here. I'm going to close my little box here. So what we basically have now is if I click the present, it's going to start with my first Hello. screen. There it is. Down the bottom, I have my little left and right arrows. If I click that, jumps through to my next one, goes down to that view. I've now that second view I've changed. And on the right hand side is my large text box. So we can create a whole lot of information. We can get students to create stuff that's super immersive, that is a little bit different. And also, if I then wanted to go, okay, I'm going to do one more feature. I'm gonna uh, do a quick search. I'll do Mana Island. There we are. Mana Island, where they're currently filming Survivor Australia. Um, Sport it, Survivor Australia's done on down this down side, right inside here, and all the resorts are up on the left hand side. So sorry to ruin anybody's Survivor Australia there. Um, so if I zoom in. And then I go, I wonder actually if there's any street view here. If I grab peg person, lift them up. Oh my goodness, there's heaps. So if I drop peg person over one of these street views, it will it will slowly do a do a slow zoom today. It's gonna zoom me into that street view. There we are. And I can here go down to the bottom and capture this view and add it to my project so we can even have street view in there as well so it's called mana text here and there uh, if i just do a bit of a a swift little turn like that there we go i'll capture that view 
So now that view is saved as a location in, uh, in my little Voyager story I've created here. So that's what it looks like. If I click back and I go present, I now have my splash screen. I have my second one, which is over to plantation. There we go there. Right hand side I created. Next one flies us up to mana into there and drops us right into the beach in Street View. So lots of different things you can use to create some really cool resources. And if you're talking about a place in the world, what better place to what better better way to actually use than Google Earth, which has all these amazing, amazing photos. If you want to upload your own photos, you can upload your own photos um, to Street View and then jump into your own photos um, on Earth as well. So that is a really fast lightning talk through Google Earth. There is some amazing stuff in there. Um, give the kids a chance to play with it, see what they can create. It is a really engaging way of showing information. Thanks, Steve. That's awesome. I'm just going to jump back in and take over the screen. If that's yeah, okay. I should stop sharing. Because um, I just want to jump back to our slides. I want to show you a couple of things quickly. Um, one is this one. So uh, uh, Steve did a great job of showing you some projects and how you basically build this project. This is an example of one I did with some kids a couple of years ago. This is um, we, we read a book called Panikin and Pinter. It's a story of two pelicans that do like a migration journey around Australia. I've actually got it open here. I'll just quickly jump in and show you this tab. So uh, again, this is Google Earth, and this is what Steve was talking about. Once you create all these um, uh, steps in your project, uh, and so what this one looks like, this, this journey of the birds in this in this uh, story, oops, didn't let me click that, starts up here in channel country and then sort of follows this migration path. And what we did as a class, we took this story, we put a nice little splash screen on the front of it, like it looks like that. You know, so sorry, I'm going to jump in again, Christy. There's, there's lines on there as well, so you can add lines, you can yep. add areas and all that sort of stuff as well. So Chris is you the lines really, really nicely on this. So when you come in here, like it, it opens up and it shows you that, but then it flies to like the overview. Okay, here's what the Pelican journey was about. But then you go, okay, the first step, and it flies you into this part of the book and then puts a quote from the book down the side here and asks the students a question, like, here's a quote from the book. Do you think this is a good description? Why? And then it goes into some, some further sort of discussion of the stuff that they're reading about in the book. Flying over to the next bit flies you down somewhere else, and then it asks another question about something else there. You know, well, why would this be a good place for birds to be, to be popular with birds and so on? So we're using the storybook that the children have read and then this particular storybook mentions a lot of places so it lends itself really well to google earth and then sort of taking this sort of earth concept and sort of following the story along in ways that maybe are hard for students to visualize because a lot of students have never seen this part of the country so they don't know what it looks like uh, and so on so so that's an example of how i have used it in the past but there's lots of ways you could use it um but yeah so that's that uh, if you want to play with that, by the way, uh, if I go back to this tab, um, if you want to have a look at that, the bird one that I, I was showing you, it's just bit.ly slash GE underscore PNP. That's Google Earth underscore Panikin and Pinter. So if you want to have a look at that one, that's the link. And it's open. Um, anyone can go and have a play with it. Uh, right. Um, if you want to learn more about this stuff, Steve and I did a presentation for the Geography Teachers Association of New South Wales uh, probably a year and a half or so ago, um, and we created two uh, videos for the Geography Teachers, um, one on using Google Earth and exploring within Google Earth and all the ways you can do that, and the second video was uh, using Google Earth to create stuff. So basically all the um, the project stuff that we just showed you. And it, each of those videos is about an hour long. So if you really want to deep dive into this stuff and learn the, the all the, you know, everything, um, those are reasonably good resources for you. The links are there. We do share the slides at the end of all of these um, webinars. And so, you know, don't worry about writing that down. Uh, we'll just give you the slides at the end. Hey, Chris, a couple of, couple of questions. Donna asking if it works on iPads. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, the the obviously being a tablet, it's a little bit quirkier when, when you when you. But yes, it definitely does. Yeah. Um, Donna, don't use it on the web on the iPad. Actually, get the Google Earth app on the iPad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Ryan and Kim were talking about my maps. So if you create a my maps, 
you can actually open it in Google Earth as well. So you can go and do your, your, your My Maps creation and then click open it in Earth and it will, or you save it as a KML, then open the KML in Earth, you got the same thing. So all those amazing ones you created in My Maps, you can still use them. Yep. Yeah, no, that's 100% right, Kim and Ryan. Yeah, it is, it is, it builds on what um, My Maps started uh, and, and I think it's much better. But um, because it all uses an underlying KML file structure, uh, if you can export a KML file out of one into the other, then they're pretty interchangeable. Uh, Kim also asked a question about uh, students not having Google accounts and would they be able to access it? I'd have to test that, Kim. I don't want to give you a definite answer, but it might work. We can we can check it and see. Yeah, good. All right. I think you can. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on. Thank you, Steve. That's uh, that was awesome. Um, just a couple of other things. <laughs> yes, Donna, you don't need a license. Um, <laughs> You might have heard about this, uh, the Google for Education Community Hub. Uh, this is one of the things we have not really had for the Google community for a while now, is a single place where people can sort of hang out, basically. Years ago, we used to have Google uh, Google Plus. As of you remember Google Plus, it was a kind of a nice community, but it, it just not around anymore. Um, and since then, people have wandered off into all sorts of groups. They've got their GEG groups, and they might have a Facebook group, and they could be a Google group. And like, it's just been so scattered. Um, really pleased to announce that we've just launched the Google for Education Community Hub. We are rolling it out gradually. So right now, um, you'll find it right there at www.google4edu.community.com. Um, and right now, because we're kind of opening it up slowly, the only people they're accepting right now are IT administrators. So if you look after an admin console, if you are at the person at your school who sort of manages the Chromebooks or whatever through your admin console, um, there is a community now set up for IT admins to share ideas and talk to each other. A little later this year, we're going to open it up to uh, what we call our Google Champions, which are our trainers, innovators, and coaches, and there'll be a separate uh, subgroup in here for the champions community and then gradually we're going to open it up more and more and more to you know basically anyone who's interested in you know, sharing googly things can come along here and be part of the, this community um, so yeah just just uh, make a note mental note of that if you are an IT manager you can jump in there right now but otherwise we will gradually open this up to you all um, hopefully second half of this year which we just started all right um, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things just to run through with you about some new stuff that's come from Google uh, in the last 30 days or so. Um, like I said earlier, there's lots and lots of new stuff. If you are subscribed to the What's New with Google uh, feeds, you'll know that um, you know, we put in something new almost every day. But if it's an ad mini thing or a back end thing or a hardware thing, I generally don't bother mentioning it because. You know, it's not that relevant for us often. Um, but yeah, here's, here's a couple of things that are pretty cool to know. So uh, we just had ISTE a couple of weeks ago in the US, the International Society for Technology and Education. Um, and uh, we announced a whole bunch of new things. And you can see them all listed here on this slide. Some of the cool stuff that's coming uh, is... Um, I'm just going to mute... Uh, I'll do that. Oh, thank you. Um, Thanks. Uh, so some of the new things that are coming, classroom analytics. Uh, so there is coming soon the ability for classroom teachers to be able to click a little button. I've actually got it live in one of my accounts right now, where if I'm the classroom teacher, I can click a little button and it gives me a summary of progress of students, number of assignments completed, number of uh, like when's the last time that student checked in. Um, it gives me all sorts of progress. I can drill down, click on a student's name and learn more about uh, individual student analytics. So that's really nice. Um, some other things in classroom, uh, grading scales. Oh my goodness, the question we've had so often in Australia is do I have to continually grade my students with like a, a numeric grade? I don't give my students 10 out of 10, like I give them like an A. So uh, yes, you'll be able to give grading scales using A to E or I don't know, you can, you can actually customise your own, you can actually make your own grading scale. Um, so that'll be a big deal for uh, locals, thank you. Um, grading periods, you'll be able to divide the class, uh, the, 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 the grade book up in classroom, up into terms or semesters if you'd like to do that and look at the, the progress that way. Uh, gosh, what else is good in here, Steve? Oh, read a lot. There's, there's, I mean, there's two really big ones that I love um, because 
I've been pushing both of them. Um, is one is the is the grading. So for for New Zealand educators, you can put the not achieve achieve merit excellence, um, or you can put descriptors for IB for, for for instance in there. But the other huge one is disabling submissions after the due date. Oh, yes, yes. But after the due date, the kids can't take it back and they can't resubmit it. So a lot of educators said, "Look, we can't use it for official assessments because the kids can take it back." So the so the the ability to disable submissions after the due date is coming real soon, and it's a huge step yeah. for people who are using Classroom for assessment. And you'll find that in Classroom when you're setting an assignment and you you, you set a due date, there will now be a little checkbox underneath that says uh, disable late submissions or prevent late submissions, whatever the wording is. Um, yeah, so that's a good one. Uh, Visit a class, you'll see there's one there called visit a class. Uh, that's a huge deal for a lot of school administrators who like to be able to go and drop into a class that they're not necessarily a teacher in. Up until now, a lot of schools have had to make the principal or the school leadership people co-teachers in every class just so that they can drop into any class. And that's really inconvenient for the, for the leaders um because they go into their classroom and they got like a million classes in there so now you'll be able to just drop into a class it gives you uh permission to go in there for i think two hours just to sort of add a co-teacher or add a, add a casual teacher for the day or check on a student's progress and then and then it disables or removes your access from that um so yeah so some interesting things coming uh and um we'll talk more about them as they unfold over the next few months uh next a couple of neat things i really like this one i send a lot of emails and sometimes i want to send personalized emails to a group right so i might be emailing 20 people and instead of putting them all in the blind cc the, the bcc field and sending them like a generic email to everybody what i can do now is i can mail merge from a spreadsheet into the email so that everyone gets a customized email now I mean, mail merge has been around for a long time, but it's, it's never been a simple thing to do inside Gmail. Um, you've, you've had, we've, we've done things like, um, uh, what was that tool called, Steve? The, the uh, spreadsheet thing? Um, um, the, uh, <laughs> we're, all, we're, we're all blanking on it. But there was what a way that? to do it with, start what with a you? spreadsheet and push it to the mail. Like, there was all all other tools to do it. Sorry, Kimberly Hall, you were going to say something? Autocrat, are you talking about? Autocrat, thank you. Yeah, I don't know why I'm blanking on that. But Steve Blank hey, Chris, I was working with an amazing bunch of educators today, one of whom might be in the call. Um, and if you use Bard, for instance, to create your email body and then drop it in here and then put those tags into it, you'll have a beautifully worded email with your mail merge tags inside it. Nice, nice. So yes, that, that will be appearing for you soon. If it's not already, just go to your Gmail and just check if you've got a little um, two heads icon up in the top uh, two field there. Uh, and if you have, then you've got it already. And um, it's it's really neat. I really like it a lot. Uh, all right. Uh, this one here, negotiating time directly in Gmail to schedule meetings faster. Oh, this is another one, huge time saver. Uh, some of you have seen the schedule tool that we have now inside Google Classroom. Uh, sorry, no, uh, to Google Calendar, I mean, uh, where you can set aside a block of time in calendar and designate it as scheduled time. And then people can book into it, a little bit like the old... Um, uh, appointment slots that we used to have except way more sophisticated what you'll have now is the ability to from within an email there'll be a button in your in your gmail where you can p uh, pick a time for a meeting as you can see there in the in the animated gif and then you block out a time in a calendar pop out on the right hand side uh, and then that will actually add those times into the gmail itself so someone can just pick a, a suitable time to have a meeting with you from the available time slots you've you've offered to them so I think, you know, making times to sort of speak with parents or just, you know, any of those times where you want to sort of book a time without the back and forward of figuring out who's available when, that'll be a real time saver. Uh, if you manage the admin console, and I understand not everyone here does, but if you do, um, there's a lot of settings in the admin console these days. I believe it's about 700 different settings. So finding what you want can get really kind of, um, you know, you can go down a lot of rabbit holes. Uh, so what you can do now is you can start to pin individual sections 
from the admin console to the top of the list on the left hand side there and you can see it being animated there on the side so you know if you're always using target audiences you can now pin that so it's only one click away you don't have to dig down into it every single time uh, small time saver but a big deal for those that do it uh, simplified access controls for Google Meet oh my goodness if you've used Google Meet you know that we have this quick access thing and to me, it was never straightforward. It was like, okay, quick access. So I got to turn off quick access if I want people to get in, not get in. And like, it just seemed to be all these double negatives. We've simplified it, okay? There's going to be only three settings now when you set up a meet in terms of managing access to the meet. It's open, trusted, or restricted, right? And uh, the, there's a bit more detail into what each of those settings mean. But again, we're gonna share the slides with you. And if you click on that more information link in the bottom corner, it will take you to the actual article with all the details. But um, yeah, when you set up that meet now, it can be open so anyone can join, trusted so only the people you invite can join or restricted where it's only specific people can come in. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a, a great step forward in simplifying that sort of access level into Google Meet, which I don't think was necessarily as straightforward as it should have been in the past. One other thing about Meet as well, Chris, is that you can now stipulate people as view only. So if people are a view only member of a Meet, they mm -hmm. can't turn on their cameras, they can't turn on their mics. It is basically almost like a live stream, but inside of the Meet. Um, mm -hmm. So. And if you're using Plus, um, I think you can have up to a thousand people on the call. Um, is the is the latest update that's coming to that? So, view only, amazing, amazing setting. Correct, awesome, fantastic. Now, uh, if you are on the teaching and learning or Plus editions of uh, Meet, uh, you might notice if you're in this Meet, if you get your mouse and you hover over anyone's picture there uh of the participants you'll notice you have some little icons come up in the middle of the picture now so that's a quick access to some of the features like changing backgrounds and um, muting people and doing things like that so you, you get some just shortcut access into things that you used to have to dig a few levels into the settings in order to do so again nice little time saver um speaking of saving time uh if you go to google calendar and you block out some time you you can do a thing called focus time so instead of setting an appointment with someone in your calendar, you can actually just pick a block of time and mark it as focus time. Uh, small but important change in there now, you've got a little checkbox that says do not disturb. If you set focus time and tick that box, it will mute all of your notifications. So you will truly get some focus time without people bugging you and interrupting you um, in that chosen focus time. And that's kind of all we've got for today. Uh, we're gonna wrap it up just almost on time. Uh, just a reminder that we do these every month uh, on the third Thursday of every month. Uh, I will send out a reminder to everyone the day of, so if you can make it, great. If not, we do record them and they will be put up on the website if you want to go and revisit them later. Uh, next month, we're going to be looking at developing essential design skills and we'll look at some of the skills of um, creating graphics and images and sort of designy stuff inside slides uh, and also carries across to Google um, drawings as well. So I'll have a look at that. Uh, September self-marking quizzes with with, um, with Google Forms. Uh, in October, we're looking at practice sets and then we'll wrap up the year looking at digital portfolios and hopefully something for everybody. Um, we, it, it, there is a list there. We have all of the recordings from all these are going now into a YouTube playlist. There's a thing you can scan there if you want, or again, there's the, the, the link if I give you the slides uh, and you'll be able to sort of go through and look at all that in a YouTube playlist. And finally, if you want a certificate for being here today, just head over to bit.ly slash GFE certificate, capital G, capital E, and um, fill that form in and it will generate one for you using Autocrat. I remember the name that time. <laughs> and, um, and it will send you a certificate if you'd like one. And that, ladies and gentlemen, wraps us up for this episode, this edition of um, Learn with Google for July. Uh, and we will hang around for a moment if there are any questions. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to stop the recording and um, we might see you next month. Thanks Fantastic. for joining. Amazing. Thank you, Ron, for spending some time with us. Good afternoon or good evening. Okay. <laughs>